are listening to Preconceived, where we examine the preconceptions that shape how we view the world and the paradigms by which we live our lives. Hey everybody, I'm Zale Mednick, and welcome to this very special episode of Preconceived. I love movies. I love watching movies. I wouldn't necessarily say I'm a movie buff because I know there's a lot of movies I should have seen to qualify as a movie buff but haven't, but I really like watching movies. And I love this time of year when we get to watch some of the best movies come to the screens, in this case to our television screens at home, and we get to watch the glamour of the Oscars, people who are vying for awards that they've been dreaming of since they were kids. So I am not a movie buff, but I do love movies and I love the Oscars. Now, this year, before I watched the Oscars, I read a book by Ben Zockmer called Oscar Metrics, The Math Behind the Biggest Night in Hollywood. Now, Ben is a statistical genius, and Ben went through all the years that the Oscars have existed up until 2017, and he statistically analyzed every category that the Oscars has and developed algorithms for predicting which movies would win in each category, whether it was best picture, directing, editing, sound categories, the acting categories. Now, his algorithms are far too detailed for me to explain here, and I don't even fully understand them, but he went through years and years of Oscar data in order to give us probabilities of certain movies and certain actors and certain directors and certain editors of winning Oscars based on past history. And there were a lot of different metrics that he looked at. And I thought it was such a fascinating book. And it really shaped the way I looked at the Oscars. And I think we have a lot of preconceptions about the Oscars. I think the preconception is probably that the Oscars is the holy grail of all award shows. And in many ways, that might be right. But this book did a great job at breaking down where we might get some things wrong when we think about the Oscars. And we might get some things right. What are some of the biases that we think are affecting Oscars results that maybe do hold true? And what are some trends that we didn't realize existed? Ben was super gracious because he's in very busy award season right now, and he also works for the New York Mets Analytics. So he's in a really busy part of his work year right now, but he was able to spend 15 minutes with me chatting about the book and some of the messages that he learned about the Oscars and movies in general. So I'm going to share with you the conversation I had with Ben. And then following the conversation with Ben, I'm just going to go on a little brief monologue with some interesting facts that I learned from the book that we weren't able to touch on that I think you might find interesting. And without further ado, here was my chat with Ben Zockmer, author of Oscar Metrics, The Math Behind the Biggest Night in Hollywood. Ben, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. I I read your book, Oscar Metrics. I absolutely loved it. And uh, how long did you spend working on that book and all the analytics that went into it? Uh, I appreciate that. The book overall was about four years, but very on and off uh, between my day job. I first came up with the idea towards the end of 2015 and uh, then spent a lot of time gathering data, starting to build some models, putting together the research. And then actually the last step was writing. Uh, Once all the data and everything was in, it was actually writing each chapter, figuring out what I wanted to say, how to turn the data into a story, and then starting to sell and market it and all that. Well, with uh, the thoroughness of it was extremely impressive. And as a big movie fan and an Oscars fan myself, not to the extent you are, I'm sure, it it was a really, really cool read. There's so many interesting facts that come out through your research, but what do you think are some of the biggest preconceptions regarding the Oscars through your work with this? So one that I get asked about as much as anything until this year was about the box office was, you know, is there any correlation at all between the Oscars and the box office? Do the more popular movies win more often? And it's funny, the answer kind of was yes for some period of time. And then more recently, the answer has been definitely not. And then there's this third answer for 2020, which is who knows, we don't really have decent numbers on a lot of these movies because they came out through streaming. So that's an even more confusing answer, which hadn't happened yet when I had written the book. So that one definitely is one that maybe goes against some more common notions. One that went strongly in favor uh, of a common question I get asked is, do movies that are nominated for Best Picture or movies that are more nominated in general, do they tend to win more across the board? And the answer is yes, that even categories you might think are less related to each other, there's clearly a you win this, you're also more likely to win that. Or you get nominated in this, you're more likely to win that. Especially when it comes to best picture and other categories. It might be because 
the voters are more likely to have seen Best Picture nominees or more likely to enjoy them. And then they'll vote for them up and down the ballot. The box office question was an interesting one. And when you chronicle it out in the book, it's staggering because for the first like 50 years or so, there's a massive correlation. It's almost like they were definitely a best box office hit. But then the last 15 years or so, it's been a real trend that more independent films, right? Yeah. I mean, you think back to the third Lord of the Rings, and that's really the last true blockbuster that wins Best Picture. There were some along the way that at least had some box office success. But now more and more, it's hard to even find blockbusters that are nominated. You know, Black Panther stands out, Inception stands out. But the fact that I can list those as exceptions and not the rule tells you everything you need to know about the types of movies that have been nominated recently. And even this past year, we don't have box office numbers for a lot of these. (laughs) But it's pretty safe to say that uh, this year's Best Picture nominees would not have been the smash successes that the Marvel movies are, for instance. So why do you think that trend is? Is it because there's more of these Marvel type movies that have really taken over box offices or that films are trending in a different direction? So this is the great question. Is is it that audiences have moved away from the Academy or is it the Academy has moved away from audiences? You know, if these same types of movies were being made in 1950, would Black Panther as this critical favorite, but also an audience favorite, would that have actually won Best Picture instead of seeming more like an invite to the party, but we all kind of knew it probably wasn't going to win. It's hard to say. And then you go in the other direction, you know, would Marty, which was this really sweet, adorable love story that won Best Picture, could that have had any chance in today's world? Or does it need to have something a bit more weighty and meaty and maybe dark or depressing as part of it? It's hard to say who has moved away from whom. Are audiences getting maybe less cultured? Are Oscar voters getting too snobby? I don't know how to measure this mathematically, and maybe there's elements of truth to both. So as in the Oscars maybe getting more snobby in the sense that they're honoring these movies that they're viewing as artistic, but the people who are watching are, aren't really choosing to see those movies. For me, one of the most interesting questions is how good are the Oscars at the end of the day at honoring, and it's a statistical question, but it's also a subjective question, How good are the Oscars at honoring the best movies and performances in your mind? The last chapter in your book really does explore this from a statistical perspective, comparing best picture winners to the corresponding movies from matching years that have maybe attained the longest lasting critical and audience claim. But how do you view the Oscars in general as kind of being a reliable measure for solid movies? So it's hard to say in recent years, I did in the book look at all years up to about a decade before uh, I published the book, because at least then you have the benefit of hindsight. I was able to use some math to aggregate critic polls and audience polls and, and other historical film rankings to try to figure out this what should have won versus what did win in question. Uh, and the answer is that the Oscars get it right less than half, but still fairly often. And sometimes when they got it, quote unquote wrong. It wasn't that wrong. You know, you think back to say 1939, where the math very slightly would have given it to Wizard of Oz, but Gone with the Wind is almost tied. And so it's hard to really say that they got it wrong. But then there are other years, you know, just fast forward two years after that, where it's a world of difference. Citizen Kane, uh, which this model ranked as, you know, one of the all time greats, which is hardly a surprise, lost to How Green Was My Valley. And, you know, there's plenty of examples like that, too. So The answer is yes, they do in the heat of the moment as the campaigns are all whirling around. They do get it right an impressive amount, but less than half. They're far from perfect. It's not easy to do in real time to figure out what's going to stand the test of time. And when you're talking about getting it right, I mean, you have a a nomogram or an algorithm that you explain in the book. But in general, when you're talking about if they were right, you're talking about the movie they picked 20 years later, 50 years later, whatever. How well did that stand up? How well is it acclaimed by critics? How well is it acclaimed by audiences? Has it stood the test of time? Is that right? Exactly. And to be fair, maybe I shouldn't use the word right at all or correct. You know, it could just be that something looks better in hindsight. Does that really mean that it was universally, globally better? I mean, I don't even know how you could mathematically define artistic quality. So yeah, what I was looking for was to see, okay, which one stood the test of time that historians and film critics and audiences today would agree with? And it does correspond with intuition. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that the voters back then were wrong per se. It could be that it was a movie that really spoke to people living in that moment and just doesn't speak to us in the present day nearly as well. 
it's different viewing it with the lens of hindsight. And in some cases, maybe a movie that aged well doesn't mean it was the best movie at that time if it hadn't won. And I'll say it's also worth noting that some of the ones that are really recent, the answer, quote unquote, could change as time goes by. So even looking at recent decades, the math would have agreed with the wins for the third Lord of the Rings and Gladiator and Titanic and uh, Schindler's List and Unforgiven. Uh, you know, all these movies, let's, let's ask this question again in 100 years, in 200 years. Will those still consider to be the best of their years as they are right now? Or as time goes by, will there be some under the radar movie, maybe a movie that wasn't even nominated by the Academy that will then many, many decades later, will be like, oh, wait, that was that year. It didn't get any notice at the time. And now we all think that was the best movie of that year in the 90s. Totally. There's a lot of confounding variables that struck me and biases that are intrinsic in the way the votes are cast for the Oscars. You mentioned that there's about, when you wrote the book, about 8,000 or so voting members of the Academy. But you say that it's likely that a lot of the voters haven't even seen all of the movies and performances. And there's on average 54.9 films nominated per year. So what does that tell you about the credibility of the Oscars? Did that disappoint you when you consider that? My my dream would be that the only Academy members who vote in every category will be the ones who swear up and down they've seen every single nominee in that category. And so if there's a category where maybe they've seen four out of five, they choose to abstain and let the other voters handle that one. That, because I have respect that these are voters with busy lives, they're busy people, they might not be able to watch 55 movies, 60 movies every single year. Uh, I, I totally understand that. But there's no way of policing that. There's no way of guaranteeing that. There could be voters who see four of the five nominees in a category. Probably more likely they've seen the Best Picture nominees in the category, or more likely they've seen the higher nominated films in the category, or the ones that did better at the box office. And they might decide, well, I've seen four out of five. That's good enough to vote. There's no way of knowing, especially without seeing the individual ballots and polling all the the Oscar voters after the fact. So that does leave a bit of a question mark in the air. You know, how reliable are the voters at picking the best? It could be every single voter sees every single movie. There's no way to know. So I shouldn't cast dispersions. It's just without the Academy breaking down the individual votes, it's really hard to say. So how much does industry come into it then? Because industry is then obviously campaigning for certain movies and performances to get noticed. I guess a lot of that's before the nominations, but even after the nominations. So are there a lot of good performances and a lot of good movies that might have been buried in film history, at least as viewed by the Oscars, because they didn't have that campaigning? Is that a real variable that affects things? Oh, I definitely think so, especially in more recent years. You know, the modern Oscar campaign, as some say, it goes back to Shakespeare and love. There's different dates people would put it at, but it's become a full-fledged industry. I mean, uh, I don't need to tell you this, but uh, like I'm out here in Los Angeles just driving around town and you see billboard upon billboard. It's everywhere. And my theory has always been this. I don't know that the voters are necessarily seeing billboards and thinking, oh, I really did like that movie more. Like, I'm going to change my vote because I saw that billboard. But where I do think it matters is every year there's about 300 or so movies that are eligible for Best Picture. And it's impossible to see them all unless maybe you're a full-time film critic. But these are people, they're not film critics. They work in the industry. They have other jobs. They're busy. And my theory has always been that where the campaign really helps must be in which ones they choose to see in the first place, uh, which ones even have a chance of getting nominated. And then once we have the nominees, then people start to hopefully see all the movies. But before that, How do we even know of those 300, if I'm a voter, which one I should even go out and see in the first place to consider? I think that's where these Oscar campaigns are huge. I want to talk about this notion of a career achievement Oscar that you mentioned in the book for actors and directors, people who might be honored for works that might not have deserved recognition if those performances or films were viewed in isolation. The example that comes to mind is Martin Scorsese for The Departed when he won that and hadn't won for any of his other masterpieces. And some people said that really wasn't Scorsese's best movie. I love The Departed, but a lot of people say that. You looked into the statistics of that in the book to see how much of an effect is there really that voters are voting for people because they felt like, maybe this wasn't their best thing, but I want them to win an Oscar because overall their career deserves it. Yeah, and the answer is it's pretty tiny. What I found was that the effect is about a 6% boost, give or take, in how much it helps a nominee win an Oscar, which it, that is a boost, uh, but it's not that much. And, you know, we actually saw that this year. So Glenn Close is now 0 for 8. Uh, that ties Peter O'Toole, most winless actor or actress of all time, 
uh, O'Toole did win an honorary Oscar, but among competitive Oscars, both sit at 0 for 8. And a lot of people were thinking coming in, you know, okay, is this finally the year for Glenn Close? They were thinking that a couple of years ago uh, when she was favored to win for The Wife and did not lost to Olivia Coleman. And that's a good reminder of the fact that these more sentimental type stories, yes, there is a boost. That's what that 6% represents. 6%, however, is not 100%. It's not a full boost all the way to a guaranteed win that maybe some people have in their minds it might be. So yeah, there are examples that go the way of Martin Scorsese. The, yeah, I referenced that in the chapter. That's a famous one. He wins for The Departed. Some people said it wasn't his best work, but there's plenty of examples that go the other direction. Last thing I want to ask you is just about the acting categories. And one of the statistics that you showed, which blew my mind, was some of the age demographics regarding the acting categories, that there's very specific trends, that best actor, for example, very much actors in their 40s and 50s have a considerably higher chance of winning that award. Younger nominees, aside from Adrian Brody, nobody under the age of 30 has won that before. Whereas you look at best actors, and it's a very different story, there's a very strong preference for young women. 32 winners were in their 20s, from 21-year-old Marley Matlin in 86 to 29-year-old Reese Witherspoon in 2005. And then it really dips off in middle age. So what did... What did this tell you about movies, the industry? What were some of your takeaways from those statistics? Well, I think the big thing that I, I don't want to say learned, but feel like I confirmed from this data is just how differently the industry treats actors and actresses. It, it's really stark when you look at the data, when you look at the graph that I presented in the chapter, when you look at all those examples you just listed, all the statistics, that it, it's way too much of a difference to feel like coincidence. Now, there's a number of different culprits you could blame here. You could say it's just the Academy in terms of who they choose to honor. Are they more biased towards older actors and younger actresses? Or is it the people making the movies themselves? Uh, is it the screenwriters that are creating more Oscar-worthy roles for younger women and for older men? It's hard to know where exactly along the trail from initial idea for a movie through the Academy Awards, this bias comes into play. It could be the answer is multiple places. But what's really undeniable with this data is that the bias does exist regardless of where it comes from. Ben, do you have any final thoughts to share about what you learned from this book? Did anything really resonate you, I guess, with how you feel about the Oscars? You obviously love movies. You obviously love award shows or you wouldn't have spent this kind of time writing this book and doing these analytics. Do you come out of this book feeling more connected to the Oscars? Or did you feel more disappointed by some of the things that you found? I think that I definitely feel more connected to the Oscars than, than ever. I got to get so into the weeds, and not just into the weeds of the data and the math and the statistics, but really into a lot of the stories behind these numbers that I got to learn, many of which I got to share through this book, some that are very famous, some that are pretty obscure. But the other lesson I really learned now that I look back on the book, and this is hardly an old book. Uh, this book came out less than two years ago. But it's just how the Oscars, we think of them as, you know, it's always the same constant unchanging thing. And they're really not. You know, I had a chapter in there about best popular film, because when I was writing the book, that was a possible category. And fortunately, before the publication happened, I was able to change it and say, well, they decided not to go with this category. I had two chapters, one about best sound editing, one about best sound mixing, because those were different. We talked about Glenn Close. I listed her at the time as 0 for 6 at the Academy Awards. That's wrong. She's 0 for 8 now. And so both the structure of the awards and the history, all the records that fall, when we're only talking about an award show that's 93 years old, it's not that surprising that records are going to fall, data is going to get updated every single year. And that's pretty fun. It feels like that makes an award ceremony that's still very new and very fresh and always changing. And a lot of the data and statistics I put in that book will be even more wrong in 10 or 20 years because all these incredible actors and movies that we haven't even dreamed of yet are going to smash all the record books. And I hope you'll continue doing the stats and update the book over that period of time. Ben, thank you so much for joining me. I know you're super busy. You've got a bunch of really interesting jobs that you do, and this is a busy time of year for you. So thank you for taking this time. Where can people learn more about you? I'll post the link to the book in the episode notes, but where can people follow you on social media? Yeah, well, first, thank you so much for having me. This was really fun to, to join on for the podcast. But yeah, I have a Twitter account, Ben's Oscar Math, and I use it throughout the year to keep track of my predictions and also to share all sorts of fun trivia facts throughout every award show during the year. 
Well, I'm so delighted. Thank you so much. I can't speak more highly about your book and the work you did. And it's been such a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks a lot, Ben. Thank you so much. Same to you. So that was my conversation with Ben. I hope you enjoyed it. And as promised, you're going to get a another short little monologue for me today. I don't usually do this on the show, but I wanted to share a few of the statistics that really resonated with me when I was reading the book. If you're wondering what is the best predictor of winning best picture in terms of getting an award at the Oscars, if you get a nomination for best film editing, that is most correlated to winning best picture, more so than any other category, including director. Now, Best Director is still an extremely high predictor of Best Picture. Only four films have ever won Best Picture without getting at least a nomination for Best Director. The only four films that won Best Picture without getting a Best Director nomination were Wings in the inaugural Oscars year in 1927, Grand Hotel in 1932, Driving Miss Daisy in 1989, and more recently Ben Affleck for Argo in 2012. In the 90 years of Oscar history, the Best Director winner also claimed Best Picture 65 times. So that's a 72% concordance rate. So that's pretty staggering. If you like other awards shows and you're wondering, what's the best show to maybe predict what's going to happen at the Oscars? Now, it depends on which award you're talking about. But overall, Ben said if he's going to recommend one award show for people to watch, if they want to get a hint of what might happen at the Oscars, it's the BAFTA Awards. We spoke about the acting categories, but I want to break it down a little bit further because this stuff really intrigued me. The correlation of age and acting awards. So, like we said, best actor. Actors in their 40s and 50s have a considerably higher chance, much more likely to win this award than younger or older actors. If you are younger than 30, only one person has ever won the best acting category. And that, like I said before, was Adrian Brody. So if you're under 30, you're not going to win the Oscar most likely. If you're in your 40s and 50s, that's when you're going to do it. But then after your 40s and 50s, if you're older, of the 22 nominees above the age of 63 for Best Actor, only one has won. So if you're not in your 40s and 50s, it's pretty tough to get a Best Actor win. Best Actress is very much different than Best Actor, like we said. A strong preference for younger actresses. Then there's a dip in middle age. Only two of 90 Best Actress winners were in their 50s. Shirley Booth and Julianne Moore were both 54. And again, this data was only collected up until 2017, so that may have changed. And then there's another uptick in the 60s, where there have been seven winners between ages 60 and 63. So if you're a woman, you want to be under 30, or you want to be maybe just a bit above 60. Now, the ones we didn't touch on in our conversation, Best Supporting Actress has the most gradual curve of the four, so age is least effective on this category. But Best Supporting Actor really favors older nominees more than the other three acting categories. Supporting Actor nominees under the age 27 are just one for 25. So similar to Best Actor, if you're in your 30s, it's very unlikely you're going to win a Best Actor Oscar or a Best Supporting Actor Oscar. Beyond that, though, the curve is pretty simple and just keeps on going up. So for best actor, after age 27, the older you are, the more likely you are to win an Oscar. If you are a budding actor and you're hoping to win an Oscar, what role should you play? So the statistics show that in terms of genres, playing a historical figure has a higher chance of earning an Oscar. So Meryl Streep, when she played Margaret Thatcher, in The Iron Lady, that was a role that was more likely to garner her an Oscar. Now, she's obviously fantastic, as are the people I'm about to mention next. But when Daniel Day-Lewis played Abraham Lincoln, again, playing a historical figure like Lincoln, that has a significant effect on one's chances to win the Oscar. Now, lastly, what are the biggest upsets in Oscar history? And when I say upsets, I mean at the time. I don't mean looking back what was a movie that should have been recognized but wasn't. I mean, going into Oscars night, what was the biggest shock where all the analytics were suggesting one movie would win, but another one did instead? The biggest shock was Crash defeating Brokeback Mountain in 2005. Going into that night, Brokeback Mountain had a 73% likelihood of winning Best Picture. Crash only had a 23.5% likelihood of winning, but it did. The fourth biggest upset in Oscars history was when Moonlight beat La La Land in 2016. Now, you will remember that Oscars 
because it was infamous since La La Land was incorrectly, erroneously declared as the best picture, only several moments later to be revoked because the wrong card was read and it was actually Moonlight that won. Now, that on its own made for one of the most shocking, if not the most shocking Oscar moments of all time. But what a lot of us, including myself, didn't realize was that that was extra shocking because Moonlight wasn't expected to win that night. La La Land was strongly expected to win that night. So La La Land, which had just been crowned the winner, that wasn't a surprise at all. So not only did they take it away from La La Land, but Moonlight wasn't expected to win that night. La La Land went into that Oscar ceremony with a 62.3% chance of winning Best Picture, whereas Moonlight was at a third of that with a 21.5% chance of winning the Best Picture. So that's it for my long monologue about the Oscars. I'm so grateful that Ben was able to chat with me for the time that he was. And I hope that if you, if you like the Oscars and you love movies, you'll learn a little something that will make the experience of following the Oscars in future years a little bit more interesting. And that if you're not a movie person or not an Oscars person, hopefully you still learned something too and enjoyed it. So that is all for me today. Thank you everybody for listening to another episode of Preconceived. Have a great day. Thank you.